Hello everybody, this is your host, Nathan Tarantula, and today I'm wondering about the legality of hunting Bigfoot. Is it legal or illegal to hunt Sasquatch in your state, county, or area? After doing a few minutes of research, I discovered the fact that most states consider Bigfoot a non-game animal. They may even classify it as an invasive species since it's not listed as a normal animal for that region or state. It appears that the classification of endangered species does not cover Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or the skunk ape, at least in the United States of America. So in other words, it's perfectly legal to shoot Bigfoot, especially if he's on private property and you have the permission of the landowner. In fact, the method of hunting is not specified, so essentially anything's open and there appears to be no bag limits on such a kill. So there you go. I personally find that pretty sad. But it's good to know that not all hunters are out to kill Bigfoot, and those that see him, there's a good percentage that wouldn't shoot him anyways. I'm speaking specifically now about myself and a few other friends that used to go hunting all the time. Up until that one year, when my son was born, and I couldn't accompany the guys on the trip. Oh, but I got a great email from them. Let me tell you about it. This was in the fall of 1990. John and Mike and Dennis had went up. Without me, of course, and they knew why. We all had a favorite place to go, one of our buddies' uncle had about 150 acres of land that was next to a national park. Deer and bear were most of the things that people hunted in that area, and we specifically stayed away from the bear and went more for the deer, which can be quite tasty, and there's no lack of them in that area. Say what you will about hunting and killing, me and my friends did not do it for a blood sport. We ate the darn things, and we enjoyed getting out in the air and having a chance to rebond every once in a while. And there was also the upside of every one of those that we took out of the field and put in a freezer was one that wasn't destined to go through the windshield of a car on the highway in the middle of the night, which is the fate of far too many of these deer. Now we've got favorite spots out there. And all of them have some kind of rudimentary shelter we've built up over the years. But there's no electricity or plumbing or anything like that. No one of these sites was near a large pond. The pond was big enough where if you wanted to fish on it, you could pull in bluegill and the occasional bass. The woods nearby abounded with all kinds of animals, squirrel and rabbit, raccoon, possum, the occasional bobcat, and the occasional coyote. It was one of the more idyllic sites on the land, and it was one of our favorites, of course. The trip went pretty much like they always did, especially in the beginning. I can imagine it well enough, having been there many times. The clean and crisp air, the sound of the forest, the sizzle of bacon in the morning. Yeah, all that camp stuff. When we didn't hunt, for whatever reason, there was always something else to do. Leaky roofs need to be mended, wood rot needs to be checked, maybe throw some paint on something. It all helps. John explains in his email that the first day passed uneventfully, aside from the fact that none of them saw any game, which is a little unusual, but not unheard of. Evening approached, and they did the usual thing, which is light a campfire and drag out the chairs. Now the chairs are these old tubular aluminum lawn chairs. And we favored the lounge version of the lawn chair out by the campfire, especially if we fell asleep there at night, which we often did, because part of the campfire ritual is drinking. And I have to assume they did that too. Around the middle of the night, after John and them had fallen asleep along the fire or went inside the shelter for the night, things got a little weird. Now I'm going to describe the layout of the camp a little bit so you can see it in your mind's eye as clearly as I can recall it in my memory. 
The campfire pit was about 50 feet away from the shelter that we could go to in case of a storm. And there was a latrine about 30 yards away on a hill that overlooked the pond. There was a well-worn trail that led to it. Of course, it was nothing but a hole in the ground filled with lime and the usual contents with just enough of a shelter built over it to give you some privacy from the elements. John says he woke up around 1 a.m. He thinks he heard a noise or he sensed movement nearby. But when he opened his eye just a crack, it looked like somebody was moving near the fire. John says that he could see Dennis on the lounge chair nearby. He could see the lump of his form under a sleeping bag. It seems that Mike had taken a walk to the latrine. Staying still as a hunter, John observed the figure by the fire. He noticed a couple things right away. It was short and stocky. Its legs, which he could see in silhouette quite clearly thanks to the fire, didn't look right. They were bent wrong. They were animal legs, like a dog's hind legs. Its arms were long and thickly muscled, ending in large hands that showed short, curved claws. It didn't exhibit a stitch of clothing, and it seemed to be covered with hair. Due to the way in which he was laying, John says he couldn't see much above the shoulder of the thing. To do that, he'd have to move. And every nerve and instinct in his body screamed at him to remain perfectly still. The fire popped and hissed. The thing standing there scuffled a bit, seemed to back away, but not very far. It appeared to be curious. And that's when Dennis, in a sleeping bag, moved. Several things happened at once. In the woods, distressingly close, came a howl unlike anything he'd ever heard. Suddenly, Dennis shot Bolt upright in a sleeping bag. This creature whirled around and crouched at the same time. It jerked and grunted, and with a hideous squirting sound, ejected a stream of fecal matter on the ground as if it had come out of a jet. Then it ran. It was gone in an instant, leaving nothing but its poop behind. Mike came running into the campfire light. He'd had his own encounter on the way back from the latrine, with a stench, he said, and a shape in the dark that seemed to be tracking his steps from a distance. The stench, he says, made the latrine smell like perfume. But of course there was another stench now by the campfire, thanks to the deposit made by their visitor. Dennis bent to examine it. Now, Dennis works as a veterinarian, so his interest in the scat was more professional than just curious, and he began to poke at it. He got a flashlight and looked closer at the disgusting mess. Some had gotten into the fire and was steaming now. All he says of the smell from the steaming poop in the fire is that it's indescribable, and I'll take his word for it. That's the part of this trip that I'm glad I missed. While Dennis inspected the poo, John and Mike went to the shelter to retrieve their guns. They returned to the fire, and Dennis had something very interesting to say. This creature, he told them, is infested with parasites. With a stick, Dennis pointed out a squirming little worm in the gelatinous black ooze the creature had left behind. They debated what they should do. None of them felt like going back to sleep after this event. Dennis went to his car. 
He came back with a bottle. He explained to the others that it was worm medication. Since they just arrived, they had a well-stocked cooler, and in that cooler were a number of bratwurst. Dennis took several of the bratwurst and stuffed them full of medicine. Then, of course, John said, they had to figure out a way to get the bratwurst to the sick animal. Just laying it down in the forest would pretty much guarantee that it went to possums and raccoons. They came up with a bright idea. They decided to walk into the forest a few hundred yards, start a small campfire, and wait. And that's pretty much what they did. However, John brought along a hammer and some nails. When they made their campfire, he took a short walk around the perimeter where it got dark. And behind several of the biggest trees, at face height, he nailed those bratwurst. There were three of them, by the way. So they sat down by the fire, chatted, and watched the dark. The fire spit and popped. The night passed. As purple fingers of twilight began to illuminate the sky, they took a look around. Each one of the brats was gone. Now I should add here that Dennis was the only one that got a really good look at the creature. His description agrees with everything that John saw with the addition of one solitary fact. It had the head of a very large dog. Well, they still don't know what to make of it. Whether or not the doped up bratwurst got to the intended patient or not, but they did decide to cut their hunting trip short that year. I don't think any one of them wanted another encounter with that creature, sick, healthy, or in between. And then, of course, there was the matter of the one in the woods that howled. It was certain there were more than one of those things out there. But I have to tell you, I'm quite proud of my friends. They are true animal lovers. And I have to say, I wish I had made that trip even though I don't regret being in the hospital room when my son was born. That's an experience easily on par with encountering a sick dog man in the woods. All right, folks, I hope you liked that little peek into my history. Remember, there are odd things out there. All you gotta do is be in the right place at the right time. But knowing where that is, is the trick, I suppose. If you've got something to say about today's production, please comment below. Subscribe to my channel. Click that bell, that way you'll be informed when a new production appears. Until then, this is your host, Nathan Tarantla, reminding you to keep an eye on those shadows. shadows.